When you want to talk Oklahoma football, it's always a good thing to go to Parker Thune, OU Insider, 247 Sports, Sports Talk 1494.7, The Ref. Parker, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic, Mark. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. And the spring game hits us on Saturday. We're a few days away. Before we get to what you're looking for uh, out of the Sooners and um, Brent Venable's staff, Isaiah Thomas was on the RJ Young show sometime this week, and I saw a two-minute clip in which he basically took us through the timeline from his perspective of the Lincoln Riley meeting with the players, um, how he left the team, and whether you saw that or just, uh, you know, we didn't really review the Lincoln Riley uh, departure from the standpoint of not necessarily the decision he made, but how he went through the process of meeting with his players and uh, just just your thoughts about uh, that uh, situation that con continues to to really resonate with people. Yeah, Mark, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in the 21st century, it is increasingly difficult to pull off as much subterfuge as Lincoln Riley managed to pull off in the weeks and months leading up to his departure. And when I say that, what I mean is, there was not a soul within that building or elsewhere that thought USC was even on the table. In fact, as you recall, all of the rumors leading up to that fateful Sunday when he announced that he was taking the USC job, all of the rumblings that we heard were for Lincoln Riley to LSU, right? It's LSU is making a strong push for Lincoln Riley. Oh, talks are intensifying between Lincoln Riley and LSU. Oh, there's an offer on the table for Lincoln Riley to be LSU's head coach. Now, look. Here's I know a few things with regard to how it all went down, Mark. First off, Lincoln Riley had the LSU offer. If that job was the one he wanted, he could have had it. However, the reason why USC was more appealing to Lincoln Riley, uh, at least ostensibly and from what we know, is that he really wasn't on board with Oklahoma's move to the SEC. That was not something that he was looped in on. Those conversations uh, within the administration were happening without his knowledge up until about the time that Oklahoma announced, or I guess didn't really announce, but it became public uh, via that report uh, from the newspaper down in Texas that, you know, it's a possibility that OU and Texas are going to be leaving for the SEC here soon. And then within, I think, two weeks, it was official and the SEC had two new charter members. So, with that in mind, and kind of with the knowledge that Lincoln Riley didn't really want any part of the SEC, we had it on pretty good authority that LSU wasn't going to be the destination. Now, I will say this, there were folks within that building and within the program that were preparing contingencies in the event that he were to leave for LSU. Most everyone figured that if he was going to leave, it would be for that LSU job. So the announcement that he was going to USC really blindsided everybody. And in hindsight, it's probably something that everybody should have paid a little bit closer attention to because that job had been open for almost three months with essentially radio silence as to who was in contention for the occupation and who the leader in the clubhouse was, who was on the table as far as the candidates that the Trojans were pursuing. Now, from the player's perspective and from the coach's perspective, when the news was announced on that Sunday, when he held the team meeting to let him to let everybody know that he would be headed out west to USC, uh, there were a lot of hurt feelings. And, you know, we talked about this at length a couple months ago in the immediate aftermath of it all, Mark. And the reality is I don't think anybody – in the Oklahoma circle, whether players or coaches, administrators, fans, I don't think they would have had any issue with Lincoln Riley leaving if he hadn't left in the manner in which he did, which was essentially misleading everybody, proclaiming, uh, well, in hindsight, while he did proclaim or seem to proclaim that OU was the job he wanted to be at in the long term and that he had no intention of moving on, he always left the door cracked open just enough. And it was an all-time chestnut checkers move on that Saturday night when he looked reporters in the face and said, I'm not going to be the next head coach at LSU. So yeah, that's really what it boils down to. And that's what the frustration is. It's not that he left. 
It's simply that he left the way that he did and that there was such an effort to, and I don't want to necessarily say mislead everybody, but to conceal the truth as to where things stood between him and USC. And also calling into question his investment in the 2021 season for an Oklahoma team that was positioned, many thought, to make a serious run at the playoff, and they were still almost right there anyway, mm-hmm. even without some some compromises and, and that disclaimer. So we'll never know what it could have been with a, a fully focused Lincoln Riley in 2021. Parker Thunes here from uh, OU Insider on 247 Sports. You can also catch him weekdays at 11 a.m. Central Time. Sports Talk 1,494.7, the ref. All right. I'm sure, I don't know what the percentages are, but I I know it's uh, somewhere down the middle in regards to half the people continuing to be fascinated with this story, but half of the people going, you know what? I've heard enough of Lincoln Riley. Move on, move on, move on. So I get it. And let's go with uh, Saturday's spring game festivities um the quarterback position dylan gabriel you know i see articles and i see information concerning how the offense has slightly been adjusted just based on his the football coming out of the other side uh from the left-handed position and um them just yeah everybody adjusting to to that in particular yeah, well, I mean, it's it's different, and it's not something that Oklahoma has had to deal with, at least in the long term and in a full-time starting role since Josh Heupel back in 2000, the last year Oklahoma won a national championship. It's been that long since Oklahoma had a left-handed starting quarterback, and it does change things, Mark. It changes the flow of the offense. It, more than anything else, it changes the way that the offensive line has to play and protect, right? Because all of a sudden, what is traditionally the quarterback's blind side flips and all of a sudden it's the right tackle that is taking care of the quarterback's blind side as opposed to the left tackle. So yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know how much of an adjustment it's going to be. I, I think most of these guys have played enough football that there's not going to be a huge transitional period that has to occur simply by virtue of the fact that the ball, as you said, is coming out of the quarterback's other hand, but from what we've seen from Dylan Gabriel and everything we've heard behind the scenes, uh, he's a smooth operator, man. He's very comfortable at the helm of this Oklahoma offense. And there's going to be adjustment involved for everybody when you're adapting to new systems, both on offense and on defense. But most everybody in that Oklahoma locker room has accepted the challenge head on. And early reports have been pretty, pretty optimistic out of Norman most everyone is resigned to the fact that it's going to be a work in progress throughout the spring and honestly, probably into the fall as these intricate new offensive and defensive systems get fully installed. But the ceiling for this team in the fall of 2022 is very high. As long as that learning curve gets flattened just a little bit. Now as uh, play in Sue's on Saturday, uh, different things could catch your attention, but as it stands right now, going into Saturday, what's on your radar? Well, I think it's – look, the reality of spring games, Mark, is that they're as much of a lose-lose as they are a win-win. Right? When a team is engaging in an intra-squad scrimmage that's open to the public perception, <laughs> either the offense is going to outperform the defense and – Thus, the perception thereafter is going to be, well, the defense isn't up to par or the defense is going to outperform the offense and people are left wondering, well, is this team ever going to score a point this fall? And so there will be overreaction. There always is this type of game more than anything else. It's really an opportunity to see how the newcomers have adapted to their new environment, whether that be transfers or whether that be true freshmen. We've talked about Javante Barnes at length before. Uh, That's a guy that I think Most fans, if they don't already know what he's capable of, they're going to get to see a glimpse of it with their own two eyes on Saturday. And you look at the impact transfers that they've brought in on the defensive side of the football, guys like Jonah Laulu, formerly of Hawaii, Jeffrey Johnson from Tulane, Trey Morrison from North Carolina. It's those types of guys that I think are going to be subject to increased scrutiny because they're going to be new faces to so many people. And, you know, people are going to point out number six or number eight or number 77 and say, I don't recognize him. He looks really good, though. Or I don't recognize him. 
oh boy, I hope he doesn't see the field for this program come the fall. So uh, that that's the reality of these types of games, Mark, is that there are always going to be overreactions and it's for the fans more than anything else. The team has no motive to open up a practice or a scrimmage to the fans other than to generate buzz, generate public interest behind the team, get everybody uh, on the same page as far as the support of the program heading into the fall and to give everybody a look at what those newcomers, whether transfers or freshmen, look like at full game speed. Yeah, and the, the fans need to keep in mind, I need to remind myself from time to time, this is simply televised. That's the only difference. It's one of 15 sessions. It's no more or less important unless the coaches uh, have an emphasis on it uh, themselves. Otherwise, it's one of 15 and you know, some guys could be having mediocre springs and then just pop on that particular day or vice versa. Obviously, everything gets magnified during the spring game in regards to people's perceptions on who's had a good camp and who has not. Yeah, certainly. It's it's one of those things where you have to take everything with a grain of salt to a certain extent. And I can recall even last year, right, Caleb Williams had an outstanding spring game at Oklahoma. And at that point, it became evident, if it wasn't already, that, oh, you know what, this guy might actually push Spencer Rattler for the starting job. But in order to know that, and in order not just to essentially be making a knee-jerk reaction to half an hour of time on the field from Caleb Williams, you really had to be in tune with what was going on behind the scenes throughout the spring up until that point. Likewise, the guy that flashed on the defensive side of the ball for Oklahoma in last year's spring game was Jordan Mukes, a true freshman out of Choctaw, Oklahoma. And a lot of fans left that exhibition thinking, oh boy, Jordan Mukes might have a say in the Sooners defensive backfield uh, and the race to start this fall. Well, lo and behold, he is a freshman and fell victim to all the same problems that freshmen deal with every year, which is adjusting to the speed of the collegiate game as opposed to the high school game and being able to catch up mentally alongside veterans and teammates who had been in the system a lot longer. And he didn't make much of a productive dent for Oklahoma in the fall. So it really can go one of two ways. And that's why it's so important to take the body of work as a whole that individual players have done uh, and accomplished throughout the spring, as opposed to just what they do in the spring game, which you have the opportunity to see with your own two eyes. Do we know what the format's going to be in regards to live tackling offense versus defense or two teams that are divided yeah so my understanding is that it's essentially going to be a simulated game and the coaches are going to draft a i don't know what they're calling it a red and white team a crimson and cream team something along those lines but basically there will be two teams that are hand-picked by the coaches that are going at each other in a simulated game environment last year's format was wacky <laughs> I, I i don't ex i don't remember exactly how it all went down i think Lincoln Riley had the defense start with like 24 points. And then there was some bizarre scoring system where you could earn points, but you could also have points deducted if you gave up a first down or your drive stalled something along those lines. So it should be much easier for the fans to comprehend this year. And that's really what it's about. Like I said, Mark, this is for the fans more so than anything else. It's for them to get excited about what their team looks like heading into the fall. What might be easier for the fans to comprehend as well is that uh, my take is that Brent Venables is a little bit more accommodating to the media, seems to take the time to explain what's going on, what his approach is, what his mindset is, seems to be a lot more forthcoming, and that, that's that got to make your job easier. Well, it does, Mark. It makes our jobs a lot easier, and uh, it, it's it's night and day different, and that's not an exaggeration at all because... With Lincoln Riley, I mean, it's just kind of how he's wired. It's not a dig at him necessarily. It's just how he's wired. You'd get 30 minutes of press conference with Lincoln Riley. Once his time was up, he'd walk off the podium. And in that time, he'd answer 10 or 12 questions very succinctly and in concise fashion. And he'd tell you exactly what you needed to know. And that was that. With Brent Venables, he'll be on the podium for an hour and a half. And he'll maybe end up fielding eight or nine questions just because He's going into complete exhaustive detail with every single answer that you give. And not only that, but it's it, it's like the old adage from 
The Office, uh, the infamous quote from Michael Scott, Mark, sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. It's, it, it seems like that's Brent Venable's train of thought sometimes because he'll start talking about one guy and it'll lead to a conversation about another guy and he'll want to heap praise on this other guy that's also in the positional group, which is awesome. I, I understand for fans that want to sit down and be able to watch the full press conferences and see what their head coach has to say about everything. It's probably less digestible. But the amount of storylines and the amount of verifiable information, not just coach speak, that you get out of stuff like that is invaluable to media members like myself and my colleagues on the beat. And it's probably pretty clear to both of us and everybody else that besides that, there's there's no other comparison to make uh, between the head of the office and the head of Oklahoma football. They're, they're, they're very much different otherwise, no question. Uh, Parker Thune, OU Insider, 247 Sports. Join him there weekdays, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Central Time, 1400 um, Sports Talk, 1494.7 The Ref. Parker, we appreciate it. Enjoy the game slash scrimmage slash practice on Saturday. Appreciate that, Mark. We'll do it again soon.